V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one-stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Hello, John. Hi, Todd. Well, as all of you can see, Greg isn't with us right now because he's betwixt and between. I have a feeling he's probably going to see somebody about an airplane. But this gives us an opportunity, John, to uh, have a straight up conversation without Greg interrupting all the time. That would be rare. Now, I heard from you and Greg that there are actually people in the audience who want to hear more about me. Why is that? They must be nuts. I agree. <laughs> but in any event, there are we have received a number of emails of people wondering how you're doing about your efforts to return to flight after being uh, gone for so long. Well, like, as I said before, it's a Rip Van Winkle situation. As many of you know, I've been involved in aviation for several decades in a row, but primarily not on the operational side and definitely not in the cockpit although I did start flying in the late 1970s and got a private pilot's license about 40 years ago, in fact. I really haven't done any flying of note in almost 30 years. And I decided in large part because of your influence and Greg's influence, especially after we went to uh, Oshkosh last year and doing the show, I said to myself, there is so much going on in general aviation, which is not where I'd been working for years. I've been working with airlines, uh, and airline related aviation for the most part. So much happening in general aviation that if I'm gonna have any kind of insights that are useful, especially other genera- general aviation pilots, which are uh, very much our audience here, it would help if I had some more direct experience. And I thought, I've got the uh, resources here. There are airports here in the Boston area, a couple of them at least that are convenient, convenient for me to take lessons. And so I took a dive and uh, you know, jump right into it with the goal of going beyond my private pilots, which I had, again, since the 1980s. And my goodness, this is Gidget. And Gidget decided to wake up because she's very excited about my flying career as well. She's also indirectly involved in that. One of the things I have to do when it comes to flying is it has to be balanced with the rest of my life. Part of that balance is making sure that she's well taken care of and has a daycare appointment with her buddies while I'm off flying. Now that said, it's been a bit of a, an adventure. The biggest being, I really didn't have a feel for being in the cockpit. It's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to simulate it, even on the kind of simulators that are many of your homes, like x and Microsoft uh, sim- <clears throat> Flight Simulator. Quite another thing to be out there in the environment itself. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm doing it. Uh, you and I were playing with simulators a while before you did it. And uh, uh, then back, let's take it from the beginning. All right. So when you showed up, you uh, asked your instructor or chose your instructor. Let's go through that process. Well, I called the uh, couple of local flight schools and I talked with three or four of them, actually. And based on how they were on the phone, how they were when I visited their offices, my feel for the airport, I said, all right, let's go with this organization here. Let's go with this airport here. And let's talk with a couple of the instructors and see who's compatible with me. And there was a one who was a, a former um, military man. He was uh, enlisted in the Navy. And he went on and became an airline pilot as well. So he had experience with the airlines. And he had been flying for several decades and instructing for several decades. So this is someone who was uh, extremely experienced 
especially with uh, newbies like me, who even though I had flown before, it had been so long in the past, I treated it as though I were a brand new student. Now, I had my private, private pilot certificate. So my goal was to go up to instrument rating. So right off the bat, the goal was to get used to flying under simulated instrument conditions, flying with that sort of attitude toward flight planning and flight execution. Of course, when I was a, a private pilot, although I did have to do cross country and such, I didn't really worry about things such as, what's the national weather picture? Now, what's the local weather picture? How does this impact me for planning my flight? In part, I think because of his airline background, there is a level of detail with flight planning that I really hadn't uh, bothered to deal with before. And like I said before, it's been decades since I was flying. Probably the biggest change for me is the level and detail of information that is available at the fingertips of every pilot. The kind of information where you had to call flight service station, had to look up obscure uh, pieces of data that could be months or years out of date, even if you're looking at regulations or looking up manuals from the FAA. All this stuff is out there. All this stuff is available. You can do things like sign up for various services, text the uh, airport code for a particular airport, and get the uh, METARs for it right there in your phone. So there's no sense, no need to wait, no need to get to a radio and listen to it. You can get it 24-7, you have no excuse. So for me, the two biggest changes were one, just getting back into the swing of flying, and two, dealing with the level of information and managing that information in a way that's actually useful for me. You know, sometimes we think that there might even be too much information uh, for a new pilot, so it overwhelms them. Oh, in my opinion, there's way too much information. Like the internet itself, it's a wealth of information that no one human being can absorb all at once. Even if you're limiting it to aviation-related information, you really, in my case, I had to look at what are my goals? I had very specific goals. That is, I wanted to get an instrument rating. So I wasn't trying to do everything. I was trying to do one particular thing. And so around that major goal, that focused my attention as to what I should learn, what I should memorize, what I should get experience in, what kind of training I should get and when. For example, I wanted to do instrument, but I also wanted to understand the modern cockpit, the glass cockpits, the kind of thing that in the 1990s when I was at Boeing was the kind of thing that was only in airliners. But in the year 2022, it's increasingly at the lowest level of general aviation. So I didn't want to just do glass cockpit. I wanted to relearn on steam gauges and trans transition into training on both steam gauges and glass cockpits. Because some of the decision making, some of the feel of flying, etc., is different when you're dealing with one kind of cockpit versus another. And I wanted to get personal experience with that as I worked toward my certificate. All right, so learning to fly here in the Boston area, which is loaded with controlled airspace, that has to be an interesting process to get back into the groove with uh, listening and using the radios and concentrating on uh, all the flying. Oh, my goodness. And uh, you know, my, my early flying uh, was primarily in South Texas and Southern California, well away from Class B airspace or any busy airspace. I had the luxury of being able to uh, fly in rel relatively uncrowded skies. Here in Boston, of course, you have to be cognizant of that from, from, the, from day one. Uh, the airport where I fly out of Norwood, uh, the, the lower level of the uh, Class B airspace that's over us is less than 3,000 feet. So if you're casually flying and sort of like forget what altitude you're at, if you're over in the middle of nowhere in Texas and you're a couple hundred feet off, that's one thing. There's no Class B airspace. There might not be any traffic around you. But do that here, and suddenly there could be all sorts of uh, interesting things happening. And just being mindful of that and being careful with respect to how am I planning my entry into this area, how am I planning my exit out of this area, keeping aware of the three-dimensional situation that I'm in, not just where I am relative to my origin and destination, but where I am relative to uh, flight-restricted airspace, et cetera. Speaking of which, in the modern era, you have temporary flight restrictions for all sorts of things. For example, we just had the Boston Marathon here a few days ago. 
and there was a big restricted piece of airspace right over where the air, air where the uh, marathon started. That was very near one of the routes I flew just the other day. Now, I did a little look ahead and I knew that was gonna happen two days after I was gonna fly. So I wasn't worried about it, but that gets back to what I said earlier and what you said earlier. There's plenty of information. You have to pick and choose what kind of information is important to you. Yeah, so you're one of those airplanes that flying over my house. Uh, and not uh, on that particular day. If I did fly near your house, it would have been at about 3,000 feet. Yeah, okay. I, I live right at the start of the marathon. So anyway, so take us to the first day you showed up. Uh, you, you've, you've chosen your flight instructor. He's agreed to, to try to pound some sense into you. And, and I, I told him straight up that I hadn't flown literally in decades. It's been a long time. And although I did a lot of background, that uh, I'd have to relearn a lot of things. And I knew there was a lot of little things I had to relearn. And he was very kind in reminding me that there were a lot of things I had to relearn, like how to talk on the radio, like how to taxi the aircraft, like how to even uh, manipulate the controls in ways that are not going to, you know, put me in a, in a bad way. Even how I hold the control wheel, how I put my feet on the floor, he had to walk me through some of the basics, even though intellectually I knew a whole lot of things about aviation. I had to consciously forget about all of that and just come at it with the perspective of, I've got to relearn everything. Yeah, I have a private certificate, but I got that back in 1983. This is the year 2000, in that case, and that, at that time, this is the year 2021. I have to forget about that and just relearn everything from the get-go. All right, so uh, on your first day, what was it like on the first day to, for you? Uh, slightly nervous because I hadn't been in uh, command of an aircraft. Granted, I was flying dual, but I hadn't taken the, the wheel of an aircraft, a real aircraft, not a simulated aircraft, not even the sophisticated simulators I flew very briefly when I was at Boeing. Hadn't done it in decades. So there was a part of me was, all right, how do I do this right? Part of me was thinking, all right, what thing should I do if things should go wrong? Let me not, not think about that so much. Let me not think as much as I need to think. I thought I need to think. Let me not overthink it. That's the basic thing. There was a lot going through my head, but I had to focus on, okay, what is the task at hand right now? What's the terrain in front of me? What's the wind? What's it doing to me? Let me not worry about what I thought about last night. Let me worry about what's out here right now. And over time, and this has been several months I've been flying now, over time, I got a better sense of, a better awareness of what, I, what was around me and what I was doing at any given time. But at that first or second or third flight, there was just a lot of things I had to get straight in my head. Uh, who did the pre-flight the first, first few flights? Well, I did the pre-flight, didn't do it as well as I should have. Uh, there was a course checklist galore to go with the pre-flight. And I was very focused on the checklist. And the approach my instructor had toward checklist was not, okay, you do a rope thing, got to do this in order. His approach was, okay, you do the check, and the checklist is a check on what you did. So rather than going out there with a list in one hand and me pointing at something with my finger with the other, it's like, all right, I practice this you know, tabletop exercise at home. I visualize the airplane before I get there. And then I go out and do the pre-flight. And one of the things I do personally, if for some reason I'm taken off of my, my process, if I get distracted for some reason, I restart that whole section. Sometimes I restart the entire checklist from the beginning because if I'm distracted for 10, 15 seconds, what did I miss? Well, I don't know, I was distracted. How do I ensure I didn't miss it? Now, one way to do so is just to start over again. And the first time I did the pre-flight, it was relatively long because I hadn't done it in a long time and I wanted to be extra careful. I was looking at things you know, a little bit more slowly than usual and I got used to it after a while. By the way, one of the simple things I'd forgotten how to do, how do you tie down an airplane? Now, untying the airplane, no problem. But I thought to myself, wait a minute, I didn't practice this before I got out of here. And I didn't make note of what the knot looked like before I untied it. So how do I retie this thing? Let's just say the first couple of times I did it, it was less than effective. But there were some handy YouTube videos that showed me a couple of methods for tying down the aircraft, and that helped me a lot. 
All right, you know, pre flights have been something I complain about all the time because I see people that that uh, that don't do them. They do a walk around in the airplane. It's like a walk in the in the woods, looking up at the trees and not really paying attention to the airplane. And by the way, I started flying again in December in Boston, and some days I'm out there. It's rather chilly, like well below freezing chilly, and that can be uh, something to persuade you not to do a thorough pre-flight, but that's something that should be dealt with and managed ahead of time. Just because it's cold, or when I was growing up flying in Texas, just because it's boiling hot doesn't mean you don't do what you have to do. If it means you wear gloves, you wear gloves. If it means you wear extra layers, you wear extra layers. There's nothing that can replace the Mark One eyeball and the feel of your hand when it comes to touching the aircraft and seeing if there's something out of place or something doesn't feel right. All right, so uh, uh, checking the fuel. You know, there's, uh, there's, there's every year there's hundreds of airplanes that crash for running out of fuel. So what can you tell us about how you handled when you went out to the airplane for uh, how much fuel the airplane had? Well, one thing that was similar to when I first started flying when I was a teenager and now is that I was flying Cessnas. Uh, Cessna 152s and 172s back then and Cessna 172s now. And as many of you know, it's a high wing airplane. You have to climb up on it in order to look at the fuel. When I'm 19 and 20, climbing up on the aircraft, not a big deal. I'm a lot older than 19 or 20. There are a few things that are creaky that didn't used to be creaky. And I'm much more, let's just let's say, hesitant about the the hazards of falling that I was back then. So I had to be very, very mindful just in the process of climbing up there to look at it. Once I was there, I had to make sure that I physically looked in, made sure everything looked right, and I closed the cap the way it should, double checking both caps for each wing, making sure that they were closed and they were aligned correctly. So the process of checking fuel, several things that I had to just remember how to do, and several more things I had to be careful of I didn't have to be careful of before. And going through that process, I thought to myself, I have a feeling a lot of pilots out there who, for whatever reason, think that, you know what? I've been flying this airplane for a long time. I just filled this up at the last stop. The fuel gauges say the tanks are pretty full. I'm not going to check it this time. Well, first off, in my opinion, the least reliable instrument on the entire aircraft is a fuel gauge. You have to check it every time, period. Yeah, it's amazing how many airplanes run out of gas and, and how many pilots try to stretch the, the uh, their gas load to get to some place where they can get gas that's five cents a gallon cheaper. And there's been a lot of crashes. I have a very good friend of mine who lost his life because of that, chasing cheap fuel and uh, didn't pay attention. And but speaking of fuel, even the process of checking the fuel for uh, debris and other impurities. Uh, in the old days, 40 years ago when I was first flying, there were only so many ports to uh, take fuel from. Now, let me get the number right. I think there are 14 different places I have to get fuel from. Three under the engine, five on each uh, wing, which is more than it was in the old days. And in order to do it in the way that's the uh, most effective for uh, finding stuff, I have to do it in a certain sequence. It took me a while, two or three times before I remember what the sequence was. I didn't have to write it down and look at it every time. But now that I've done it a few times, it's like, okay, I got to check the fuel. I got to check it in this way. got to do it every time. All right, well, let's get into the airplane. So now you're climbing into the airplane for the first time. What was that like? Well, I knew uh, my memories of the old days was that uh, it was a pretty cramped space. Not a lot of room inside of an airplane. And uh, luckily for me, Although in the, when I first started flying, I was a rather pretty skinny guy. There were some years here where I wasn't so skinny. I had just come off of losing about 20 pounds before I started flying again. I thought to myself when I got into the airplane, I'm glad I lost that 20 pounds. It would have been more challenging, a little bit tighter squeeze in here had I not done that. And which brings up another issue. You know, I've got a few gray hairs now. I didn't back then. And I want to make sure that there's no health issue going on that might keep me from flying. So when I got my medical um, updated, I had a very nice conversation with the physician, told him, hey, here are all the things I've been going through over the years. 
they're not an issue now, but they may have been an issue a few years ago. How is it going to affect me as a pilot? So here's a situation where, sure, you can go out there, pay the however many dollars, get an aerospace medical examiner to sign off on you just to have your ticket signed. If I took this as an opportunity to have a longer conversation where I brought up the issues of, look, I'm an older pilot. I haven't done this in a long time. There are things I've gotten used to medically that may or may not be an issue now. Let me get your opinion. Is this an issue now or is it not an issue now? None of it was an issue, but I'm glad I had the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Getting old is not for the faint of heart. Well, given the alternative, I'll deal with it. Okay. okay, you're in the airport or in the airplane. Let's take it from there. Well, of course, uh, not of course. There are basically things I forgot. For example, uh, way back when, when I was flying, uh, this was before uh, headphones and ear protection were a big thing. And I thought, oh, I got to bring my, my headphones with me. Well, of course, I walk out to the air, airport, at the airplane rather, I forgot my headphones. So it was one of those things. It's like, there's so many little things that I've forgotten. Luckily, I remembered and went back to the office and got it before I flew. But that was a, another thing I had to get used to. How much do I pack inside of this airplane? Now, you can put all sorts of things into your flight bag. Question is, what do you need to have in your flight bag for this particular flight? And that's going to vary with, with every individual. But it took me a, a while to sort of streamline what works for me, what kind of kneeboard works for me. I went through a couple of kneeboards for several of them that I like. What kind of uh, briefing card setup do I want to have? How do I want to arrange things in the binder? Do I even want to use this knee board for certain kinds of flight maneuvers or certain um, lessons that we're doing that particular day? And uh, on top of that, do I want to have the stuff in the back seat? Do I want to put it in the storage area in the back? Little things like that, because one of the many things rattling through my mind is I want to have as few distractions as possible. I don't want to have a water bottle that I don't need rolling out of my bag, rolling under the seat and, you know, getting in the way of the pedals. I don't want to have extra pens and pencils falling out, going every which way where I, when I don't need them. So I really, I didn't put a lot of thought into it. But every time I went out to the airplane, it's like, okay, what have I learned about keeping the workspace as simple as possible to keep the distractions from happening? And something as basic as, all right, it's a bright sunny day. Do I wear my... Uh, regular glasses or I wear my sunglasses. They're both prescription. They both work equally well. And I thought to myself, okay, at least initially, what's the worst case scenario? If it's somewhat glaring outside, okay, maybe it won't be comfortable to look outside. But if my shades are so dark, I really can't see the instrument panel, that can be a lot more problematic. So I keep both of them with me in the airplane, but I started out with my non-sunglasses, my regular glasses. And so far, I've only flown with my regular glasses. That might change in time. But for now, little things like that where I know there might be a distraction. I don't want it to be a distraction. What can I do to keep it from being a distraction? Or if it is, what should I change the next time I fly? In other words, I didn't let the little things be so little I'm not paying attention to. Because as you and I know, any number of little things could lead to bigger things. Any small distraction could lead to the airplane being smashed all over the ground. As going back in history, 50 years now, the Eastern Airlines event out in the Everglades, where you have these three professional pilots, they're all sort of focused on fixing some minor issue in the cockpit. And they forgot to fly the plane. They flew right into the Everglades, perfectly uh, working L-1011, crashing the Everglades. Now, I'm not flying an L-1011. I don't want to be distracted by minor things that don't have to be there in the first place. All right. So the first thing you have to do after you get the engine running uh, is to use the radios. Well, that's correct. I get, get ourselves set up in, in the way the airport's laid out. We taxi up far enough so that the control tower can see us on the ground. Then we call ground, ask for clearance to go taxi we figure out where to go or try not to go the wrong way because there's a mental picture of the airport. There's the picture that's in the, uh, the documentation I have. I'm not gonna be whipping out the documentation all the time. So it's like one of the things I did before every flight really is, all right, how is this airport laid out? If I'm from this ramp, 
where am I likely to go taxiway-wise to get to the departing runway if the wind's coming from this direction? How are we likely to go if the wind's coming from another direction? And one of the uh, interesting things about the airport where I fly out of, there's quite a bit of helicopter activity going on. So one of the taxiways, very close to one of the uh, pads where the helicopters are. So rather than going right down the center line, we cheat a little bit and go a little bit farther afield to keep a proper distance between the maximum rotation uh, diameter of that rotor and our wingtip. And it's something that's not normally uh, thought about uh, when you're flying general aviation airplanes. I never had to do that at the airport. I was learned to fly on the fact it was a very sleepy little airport and the activity was very, very low. So. All right. it's, a mix, it's a mix of traffic at this particular airport, by the way. We have helicopters, both news helicopters from the local news stations, a bunch of a Robinsons that are in some sort of a training uh, situation. There's actually a, a, a company out there that's doing a training of people wanting to be professional pilots. So they have quite a bit of activity going out. There's the flight school I'm in, has a handful of airplanes, a lot of private aircraft there as well, the occasional business aircraft rolling in. So you could have anything from a, well, there was a large, I think, uh, surplus military helicopter with big bubbles on the side as though you were looking out to do forestry work, sitting off on one side is like, what's this guy doing here? He's not flying right now, don't have to worry about him, don't have to taxi fly him. But it's an interesting mix of airplanes that could be there at any given, given day. And yeah, that is a busy airport around Boston. I think it might be the busiest general aviation airport of all the airports that, that ring Boston. All right, so you're in that you're in the airplane, you've just taxied out. You're going to call for clearance. Going to call for, well, taxi clearance, of course. And when we get to near the departure runway doing our pre departure checks, then we call for uh, clearance out of the, the, uh, that particular departure runway. And because of noise abatement and other things at this particular airport, Norwood Airport, there are certain departure routes where uh, we want to take when we're leaving. And of course, there's the class B space above us. So we have to be mindful of that. And the usual uh, path is we depart, we go to the practice area, we go to the cross country airport that we're aiming for that day. How far away have you flown so far? Well, the furthest is only uh, 50 uh, nautical miles, just at the range of minimum range for having a cross country flight. As uh, things progress, we'll mix uh, various kinds of uh, work with cross country work. So from Boston, some of the airports might be uh, uh, Hyannis Airport, Barnstable. Um, we have uh, Martha's Vineyard going down to Groton, Connecticut, and other airports in the from, from New Hampshire down to Connecticut. And of course, throughout uh, Massachusetts. And all the while skirting Class B. And skirting that, skirting uh, other interesting traffic that might be out there. There's one particular uh, temporary flight restriction. Can't remember the town, but it's not too far from the airport where it's like a one mile radius. They're like exploding ordnance down on the bottom, like some sort of police ranger, they're exploding ordnance, bomb disposal or whatever. It's like, okay, I'm sure a mile is more than enough, but I definitely want to avoid this place on any given day because you never know. All right, so here you go off and flying. What can you tell us about that? Well, the, what the, a lot of people say, not a lot of people, what I say is, if I'm gonna have an hour in the airplane, it usually means about two or three hours, at least doing other things. And some of those other things are documenting what I did. Uh, lessons learned, the takeaways, the things I have to do for the next flight. And I have my own way of keeping track of that. Uh, one part of that is using the, the, the uh, app and online and, and and phone app as well as iPad app for fly, which does a lot of things for you, sort of like compiles uh, various kinds of information for your flight. Also has an electronic logbook, which supplements my logbook, which I conveniently have here. This logbook has, is a classic logbook. You can get like a line's worth of stuff and some, you know, bare bones data about what you did. But the logbook doesn't tell the whole story. And my memory is not what it used to be. I can't remember every little detail that happened. So the notes I make during the flight, 
the notes I make after the flight, I sort of compile them in one place. I have a couple places where I do it. And so I can go back and look at it. One of the tools I use, two of the tools I use, one's a four flight tool, which is you hit the button, it records your flight. So you can look later at it. You can see your airspeeds, your altitudes, how far you flew, where you flew, et cetera. You can also go to something like Flight Radar 24 or Flight Aware and look up the aircraft you're flying. All of our aircraft are ADSB out uh, equipped. So it shows up on um, Flight Radar 24. So if uh, my four flight app is not working for me, I can always go there and look at what I did and actually literally rerun the flight. Did I do four landings or three landings? Okay, let me just rerun four flight or rerun uh, Flight Radar 24. And now I know what I did. All right. Now, uh, somebody else will be rusty that hasn't flown in a while. What kind of advice would you give them? Uh, admit that you're rusty. Admit that you don't know what you used to know. And also realize that whatever situation you'd flown in the past, especially in my case, if you'd flown, flown years in the past, so many things have changed that you shouldn't go out of your way to learn everything ahead of time. But just, just be mindful that there could be some small things that change that could actually be for the better for you. Uh, and like I said before, for flight, because of their electronic logbook, I can go in there and basically treat this like a diary rather than just a compiling of you know, hours and places I've flown. If there's something there I think I should refer to later on, either mistakes I made or mistakes I corrected, I write it in there so that weeks or months later, I can go back and be like, oh yeah, this thing I had a problem with now, I had a different version of that problem back then. I'll use what I wrote one, two, three, four, five months ago to improve on this next lesson or to make that a learning point that I'll go over with my instructor before we fly next time. All right, well, I think we covered uh, a fair amount of territory. Maybe some of our uh, listeners will appreciate walking in your shoes, so to speak? But well, the one, the one thing I, I got to mention, I said my goal was to be instrument rated. But along the way, I realized a couple of things. The way the rules work, I can get a certification to be a ground instructor for instrument and a uh, advanced ground instructor who could legally give ground instruction for any number of types of uh, uh, non-commercial flying. And uh, this, unlike being a certified flight instructor or instrument flight instructor. It's something that uh, does not uh, require you to fly at all. Now, I'm still gonna be flying, but I thought, well, gee, one of the things I'm doing and I'm doing with you is outreach to other people in aviation, especially the younger people coming up. And although I haven't gone out of my way to formally instruct anyone in aviation, how much more useful could it be if I have a certification from the FAA that says, I can provide ground instruction for you in this aspect of aviation. So it's not just me telling stories and me telling you should do this. And it's like, no, we can sit down. I can give you instruction and I can sign you off on taking various tests. Very good. Well, we've uh, used up our time for this today. So I'm, we'll have the uh, continue this story, the continuing saga of, <laughs> of Todd's returning to flight. <laughs> Look out below. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I often say I made aviation safer when I stopped flying. And uh, I'm not, in a way, I'm jealous. I wouldn't get back and, and uh, fly anymore, even though when I'm off uh, and have the opportunity to fly with somebody else, I, I uh, do. But I know that uh, at my age, my reflexes are nowhere near what they used to. Now, if I, was, if I continued to fly, I'd probably be okay. But coming from someone who hasn't flown for many, many, many years, uh, I think it would be too much of a challenge to, to get back into the game. And I hope that for the sake of our audience that when we talk about things and I give insights and whatnot, the fact that I'm actually trying to do it in real time in a real way means that whatever insights I'm giving you, whatever advice I'm giving you, isn't just based on you know, theoretical things or things I did years ago. It's like, okay, these are things that are still real. And not only have I experienced them, I you know, had an emotional reaction to them. So when I tell you and shake my finger at you, it's not because I'm being some you know, person who likes shaking my finger. It's like, look, this is an important point. 
here's why it's important. And here are a couple of insights personally I had that made me realize how important it is for me to share this with you. Yes. You know, I think that, that everything that we do and everything we try to do on the show is a learning experience. Right? We try to just convey the mistakes that we've all of us have made. And some of the people have made some pretty gross mistakes and uh, share all the details of them so that uh, they don't have to be repeated. And that's what an investigation is supposed to be. And that's what all the learning programs are designed to do. So we'll do our, our piece to try to, uh, to do that. And I offer this promise to the audience, unless it's something that will get me thrown in jail, I'll tell you about my mistakes. In the air, that is. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I would like to remind everybody that uh, one of the most important things you can do for yourself when you're out there learning to fly is make sure you have renters insurance to protect yourself in this this uh, society we have today where everybody sues uh, at the drop of a hat. So if you if you want to protect yourself and your assets, uh, renters insurance is very, very inexpensive. I mean, it's far, far less than than even the most basic automobile insurance. So I wouldn't fly without it. And I don't think anybody should just to, just to protect yourself. So with that, Todd, I think that uh, we'll cut this off and uh, uh, Greg will be back eventually. Uh, maybe, maybe as early as this weekend. So we will, uh, we will pick up on some of our accidents, but in the meantime, I wish everybody would heed what we just said or what Todd just said. Good pre-flight, make sure that you've got yourself well settled in the, in the cockpit. You know, we have not talked on the show much at all about what you bring into the cockpit, you know, all the equipment, all the things that could cause distractions. So that was a good point that you raised about even pens, because I've seen those pens drive people crazy because you've dropped them. And where did they go? You know, so when you go flying, you got to do a good pre-planning session. You got to do a very thorough pre-flight. And when you get in the airplane, you got to put that head of yours on a swivel and keep the eyes open and moving all the time. You got, especially around here, there's a lot of airport traffic. You know, sometimes when I'm I'm out in the, in my truck waiting to go, I look. There's always airplanes flying over my house out here because I'm in between a number of airports, so they sort of like the space. And the in the you know the traffic going into Boston is pretty high. I'm 30 miles out out of Boston, so the traffic has uh, got some altitude to it. So they, I watch them do some maneuvers uh, right in the area where I live. So with that, my friend, uh, you can have the last word this time. Well, uh, let uh, my experience being less so to all of you, there's always stuff to learn. And don't be afraid to learn. You don't have to fly in an airplane to learn. Just realize that aviation is bigger than all of us, and we're never going to know, know all of it. So go out there and keep learning. Very good. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888 888- 879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe. <laughs>